Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to another edition of Therapy Thursday. It is April 7th, 2022, and uh, welcome you all here for uh, Therapy Thursday, uh, brought to you by UNC Health, uh, UNC Therapy Services, uh, and the Community uh, Engagement Committee. Uh, my name is Evan Adler. I am your uh, your host and curator for today, um, and fortunately not your presenter because this is not my strength of uh, of topic today. Um, however, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody in advance for being here today. I think we're going to have an excellent, excellent talk on a, a fairly uh, niche topic here. Um, but we really do have someone who is an expert in the field to, to talk about it. Um, so our, um, uh, our topic today is titled, When the Show Must Go On, uh, Dancers and Hip Pain. Uh, brought to you by our presenter, Elise Nichols. And before I turn it over to Elise, I just want to let you know that as we go through here today, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will be monitoring that during the presentation. Um, if it's something that absolutely must be answered right away, I'll kind of break in. But otherwise, we're going to try and save questions until the end. I'm also going to go ahead and put in a couple of links in the chat so you can see them um, uh, for our Facebook page where you can find more information about uh, upcoming events uh, that UNC Therapy Services is, is uh, going or that we'll be attending and um, having some involvement in and just some general information. Uh, find out about more Therapy Thursdays. And then also, uh, I'll put in the link to our YouTube channel, so you can click on over to there at some point and take a look at all of the uh, wonderful talks that we've hosted in the past. Um, and you can, they are there for posterity, so please go and explore. There's many, many different topics to, uh, to check out. And that's where this will live uh, once we finish up and get that posted on um, after we're done today. So, with all of that said, um, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Elise, and uh, we will see you all at the end. All right. So, can everyone see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So, I am excited to talk about um, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. This is injuries in dancers specifically related to the hip. And um, I have just want to give a, a little bit of background about myself first, and then we'll dive into topic uh, conversation. So, oh, there we go. Um, just about me, I am a physical therapist. I graduated from UNC uh, School of Physical Therapy in 2016, and since then I have been working with UNC Therapy Services. I treat currently at the UNC Wellness Center in Northwest Cary. Um, I'm dry, needle, dry needling certified, and I am a former dancer. For those of you who are local, I grew up dancing at the Valley School of Chapel Hill and then North Carolina School of the Arts. And I love working with dancers in physical therapy. It is kind of the thing that I like to nerd out about, and it brings me back to something that I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm also a yoga instructor in the Durham area. And when I'm not working, I like to garden and travel and spend time with my family. Um, and watch my one-year-old learn how to navigate the world. He just started walking, so that's very exciting. Hoping that maybe one day he gets to participate in some dance training. So getting started, some of the things that I wanted to cover today in this talk, going into some of the specific risk factors for dancers related to hip pain, I'll do a little short review of anatomy of the hip joint and discuss possible diagnoses related to um, hip joint pain. Also, probably what most people are interested in joining on this talk are some general education on ways to help achieve optimal muscle balance. 
um, for injury prevention, right? So we can head off the aches and pains before they start. And also to provide some guidelines of when to see a medical professional if a dancer is experiencing some sort of hip pain. So I see a lot of dancers coming into the clinic with hip pain, um, and this was somewhat So, just kind of a little bit of background, a systematic review did show that hip injuries are the second most likely body part to be injured in female dancers, and ankles are the first, but I would say the majority of the dancers I have seen lately have been coming in for hip pain, so that's sort of how this topic came to fruition for me. Um, things that... Uh, we need to consider is that there are really specific demands that dancers' bodies undergo that are different from training in most other athletic. For a dancer, it helps control the movement of the trunk and the extremities, being your arms and your legs. It's linked to stability, and it's really what um, absorbs forces of load transfer between the upper body and the lower body. It's crucial to the whole system, and also a lot of the movements in dance, especially ballet, are really hard on the hip joints, especially if you know we don't um, have proper training and technique. So specifically, the repetitive motions in end range. So we think about dance, and if you're not familiar with dance, just kind of imagining that very high lifted leg. We're doing a lot of work at end range flexibility. So. Um, that is going to create some wear and tear on the joints. And then sustained hip external rotation, you'll see just this picture to the right of the screen of a dancer in a fifth position. That really externally rotated position at the hip is something that can be problematic for some people. Postural abnormalities. Um, specifically, I, I typed in shearing of the pelvis forward, and that comes to be oftentimes when dancers sort of go into an excessive posterior pelvic tilt, or if you think about like tucking your tailbone under a little bit too much. Um, training load. This is a really big one that I see, especially in really young dancers. So in sports in general, we have seen as physical therapists an increase in early specialization in athletes. And what that means is getting really involved in one sport early on in life and um, not having a variety of inputs into motor control training. Um, dance in particular, I think this has been the case pretty much for um, as long as I know of. And, you know, you have to also consider in addition, dancers, you know, are training oftentimes year round. So it's not so much a seasonal sport where maybe someone can do swimming one season and soccer another season. Um, so that early specialization is, is, can be problematic for some dancers who may develop um, skill that overrides their actual um, gross motor skills, right? Cross training. And so that kind of sets us up for potential injury as well. Aesthetic ideal is the next thing that I wanted to mention. And this can come in a couple different forms. But if we think about dance, you know, it's different from, say, basketball, where the goal is to get the ball in the hoop. Um, and it doesn't really matter how it looks. But dance is an artistic, um, you know, artistic endeavor, right? And so the visual and the aesthetics of it are important. And so it's not just about how we're getting the leg in the air, but the lines. And, and that comes to be that, you know, some dancers who may not have full or um, optimal external rotation of the hips are forcing it, changing positions of the body to try to elongate, the, to make the, the limbs appear longer or slimmer. Um, and some of these kind of aesthetic ideals can create uh, problems for dancers. So a lot of times when people come into the clinic and they are telling me that they are coming in for hip pain, they will be pointing towards their back or their glutes, their butt. And 
I wanted to kind of just touch on this and go through a little bit of anatomy um, because that back pain or that butt pain can be due to hip joint dysfunction. But just so that we're all on the same page for the purposes of this talk, when I talk about hip joint, I'm referring to the ball and socket synovial joint that's formed between the articulation between the femur, that's your thigh bone, and the acetabulum, which is sort of the cup or the socket that the thigh bone fits into, if you can kind of see um, or imagine that. So one of the, the first things that we do is we look at um, range going through an evaluation. And when we think about joints, we want to know if there's too much or too little range of motion, if somebody is having dysfunction or pain. In a broad generalization, this is not always the case, we tend to see too much motion in dancers. So a little bit of hypermobility, um, where oftentimes one of the priorities in treatment is going to be trying to find more stability. And so kind of looking at these two images on the screen, there are two systems of stability that we can think of if we're sort of dividing them up, and that is passive and active. So passive stability comes from sort of the, the thinking of the skeletal system. Or, uh, so the way that the bones of the pelvis and the femur sit on each other um, and the way that they receive weight from the trunk and transfer into the legs. The passive stability system is mostly kind joint in the body, the shoulder being the, the most mobile joint. Um, the structures that make up the passive stability system, just again as a quick review or getting us all to understand the terminology. The acetabulum is, we can think of this as like the socket. Um, the, the capsule that sort of holds the femur in place. And the, the top of the femur, the head of the femur is the ball that sits in that joint capsule. The acetabular labrum, which, which we'll talk about later, it's sort of like a little cup that sits inside the acetabulum and it deepens the socket. So you can think of that as creating like this suction cup to hold the head of the femur in place. Um, the ligaments also contribute to passive stability system. And when I talk about um, stabilization later on when we go into more exercise invented in interventions, I'm mostly talking about active stability system, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. And that includes muscles and tendons, and also I would say um, your nervous system, so your motor control. So if we're looking at these two images, kind of I was trying to depict on your left the, the passive stability system and on your right some of the components of the active stability system. So that brings me to the next part of our discussion. Um, when we think about the active stability system, we're really focusing on this in treatment, oftentimes because that's what we have more control over in physical therapy. That's what we can change. But I did want to just um, give a little bit of information about some of the, the ways that the passive stability system can be affected and can change how somebody moves. So there is research that shows that the way that the femur faces inside of the hip joint socket affects range of motion. And so this is important when we're working with dancers or if you are a dancer to know that your skeletal system may have its own limitations, um, its own different uh, anatomical neutral position. Um, sometimes this is due to genetics, sometimes it's developmental factors, sometimes it's just related to the position that a small child liked to sit in while they were um, developing when they were little. And but um, I guess the, the important thing to know is that when the femur is looking farther backwards into the socket, the person is more likely to have internal rotation and they might have a little bit more difficulty achieving external rotation or that turnout that we're looking for in dance. The other way that the shape of the bones can affect range of motion is how deep the socket is. Um, so a really deep socket is going to offer more stability, but that person may have a little bit less range of motion. And then if the person likewise has a really shallow socket, the ball of the head um, of the femur might move around a little bit more and they might have more range of motion um, and need to rely on ligaments and muscles to maintain the stability. 
And then I think this is really interesting. Um, thinking about the, the way that the femur and the acetabulum fit together, those are developed based off of stresses to the growth plates as children grow up. And so sometimes there's a difference where the ball and the head of the femur butt into each other, and that is um, referred to as impingement. So this is sort of a hot topic in physical therapy right now. And we're seeing lots of diagnoses of this, whether it's, it's um, important that it's diagnosed this way or not for discussion, but just so that you know, femoral acetabular impingement can be two different types, well, three, but we'll go over two, the pincer or the cam. And the pincer impingement occurs when there is sort of extra bone over the acetabulum. And so that kind of creates maybe an overhang where the femur um, gets irritated on the prominent rim of the acetabulum. A cam impingement is the opposite. There's sort of a difference in the shape of the femoral head. It's not perfectly round. There may be a little bit of a bump that's formed on the femoral head that grinds against the acetabulum um, and can grind away uh, cartilage and, and create some irritation. And this is interesting. I read one study that imaging was performed on dancers um, within a professional company, and they showed that dancers with cam-shaped deformity were more likely to have hip pain. Those dancers were also more likely to have early joint degeneration um, as they went on in their careers. So I say this not because I think everyone needs to go out and get an x-ray. Um, that's absolutely not the case. You don't need to know what your femur is shaped like, and many, many people may have a cam uh, shape. Make changes in how the hip joint moves and may make a dancer at higher risk if we don't pay um, of developing further problems if we don't pay attention to the hip pain when it comes on. So that's sort of something else to talk about, and that's um, joint laxity, right? And so laxity refers to, we can think of that as being overly flexible, and a dancer or a person in general might have global laxity that refers to they're flexible all over their body. And this is oftentimes hereditary and there's not really much, you know, that you can do to make it change. But we do need to make sure that that person is as strong as possible to protect their joints. The other type of laxity that we see more often, especially in dancers and gymnasts as well, is local joint laxity. And so this is somebody whose connective tissue is absolutely normal, but because of overstretching and overtraining, um, they are finding you know, some instability in that joint. So that is something that I will talk to dancers often about. Um, all right. So looking at possible um, when we're thinking about the hip joint. FAI refers to that instability that we talked about on FAI and structural instability are what we talked about in the last slide. Um, a labral tear is when the cup that sits inside of the acetabulum of the socket and of the hip joint is torn. Iliopsoas syndrome is a form of internal snapping hip. A lot of dancers uh, are diagnosed with a snapping hip, which is sort of a general nonspecific diagnosis. But um, iliopsoas syndrome is essentially just when the psoas is snapping over the iliopectineal line. And this can happen because of a thickening in the iliacus or maybe um, an abnormally abnormal shape of um, a bony prominence. The intraarticular snapping hip pain comes from injury inside the joint, and this could be because of torn cartilage or it could be subluxation, um, but it also tends to cause pain at the front of the hip. And then hip OA, that refers to osteoarthritis, so the wear and tear of the cartilage inside the joint. Typically, we think of this in older individuals. However, because of all of the repetitive motions um, at end range and because of some of the, the risk factors that I mentioned earlier, I have seen dancers in clinic with hip OA at age 30, which is much younger than we might think of um, in typical population. So this next slide, 
it's really just meant to show that there are a number of possible diagnoses that we could find if somebody is having hip pain and hip pain is not always coming from the hip. So it could be coming from the lumbar spine. It could be coming from the pelvic floor dysfunction. It could be gynecological issues, peripheral nerve entrapment, developmental disorders, infection, cancer, all of these other things that are or could be systemic. Um, and so really the main takeaway from this slide is that even though dancers um, may think that it's common to have hip pain, it should never be considered normal, right? And it is important that it doesn't go away with rest and change in your training program that a dancer sees a medical professional to be able to rule out some of these more serious uh, possible diagnoses that are unrelated to uh, sort of the musculoskeletal issues at the hip. Um, the next slide, we're going to be talking about sort of things that are actual diagnoses um, or issues that are related to the hip where a physical therapist might be able to help. So really practical stuff of what to do if you have hip pain. And generally, physical therapists can treat patients with direct access without any doctor's referral. Um, you, you can just give a clinic a call um, and they should be able to set you up with an evaluation. On this slide are listed some common complaints that I would think would warrant coming in to see a physical therapist. So persistent pain, pain that radiates down the leg, a popping, clicking, catching, snapping, or pain that occurs after activity or rest. So not just, you know, an on off switch. It hurts when I do this, but then it's fine. Um, if it's continuing at night, especially, um, or if it lasts for more than 72 hours after activity, I think that that is a good sign that you should kind of check in either with a physician or come straight to physical therapist. I'm biased, of course, but I think we have a lot to offer. This next slide shows some of the specific movements that research has found to be really aggravating to anterior hip pain in dancers. So, Grand plie, especially in second position, extreme turnout. Um, and then on this slide, develop a uh, to second position. That's upper left picture. Deep stretches into over splits. Um, that I couldn't find a great picture that wasn't an ad for some contraption to help people stretch, but that's like when dancers will place one foot on an elevated surface and then go into extra or beyond beyond a split essentially. Deep lunges or middle splits are all things that could be aggravating. But on this slide specifically, um, I found some pictures that were related to a research study done out of Canada on impingement at the labrum. And they did functional MRIs. So they looked at dancers doing these movements under an MRI and measured how the labrum was being impinged and also how much the joint was moving out of its centered healthy position. And the most impingement was found with this picture in the top left, that is the developé in second position, um, as well as the one on the bottom, the split bending forward. They found more subluxation or more instability with um, the position in the second position developé, as well as the straddle split, which is the picture on the right. So just kind of to make it clear, these positions aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. And I would never tell a dancer that they can't do this because some of these things are really integral parts of training and dance technique. But these do, um, these do pose stresses, especially when we go, on, go beyond that person's anatomical neutral position or where there are biomechanical faults in technique. So these positions are ones that I may take out or modify, at least temporarily, if a dancer is coming in with anterior hip pain. And oftentimes just taking out those aggravating movements, but still keeping a dancer able to do their bar work, able to do their center and um, their technique classes, they might have, even just with that for a couple of weeks, um, noticeable improvement in their pain. of turnout. And I think everyone kind of understands the concept of, um, especially in ballet, that we use a lot of turnout in dance. Um, it's, noted, it's worth noting because it's a really important piece of the aesthetics of ballet. 
in ballet, the ideal turnout would be 90 degrees at each hip, and that's the picture on the bottom. But most dancers in research, it shows most dancers have only between 60 and 70 degrees between each hip, which is actually more than the general public anyways. And so if a dancer is coming into that full turnout position, they're usually getting the extra 20 to 30 degrees from their knees and their feet, their ankle and foot. And so this leads to all sorts of technique faults um, that can cause problems down the kinetic chain or up the kinetic chain and eventually make its way back to the hip. So so um, definitely lots of knee issues coming from this, but I would say it's also really important to look at how a dancer is using their available turnout um, if they are having hip pain. So that was just kind of a quick nod to the turnout. Let's see, so what do we need to worry about with muscle balance? Muscles help absorb the forces that are imposed on a joint. So if there is weakness, the joint is going to experience higher compressive forces and probably also there may be some compression, there may be some shearing or pinching, some impingement. There might be some instability that the dancer needs to worry about. Um, and so this could lead to pain or swelling. And that pain or swelling can cause even more issues where muscles may be inhibited um, and stop functioning the way that they should. So this is sort of a reaction to injury. It can lead to joint damage and excess wear and tear on the underlying bone. So it's really important to take care of our muscles and you know, seek treatment if we are having uh, pain that doesn't get better with rest. Um, muscle balance is a big issue in dancers, again, because of this repetitive motion and sort of the aesthetic ideals. So just for example, I'll go back to ballet dancers, but, you know, other dancers, modern dancers, top dancers, hip hop dancers kind of have their own set of muscle imbalances. But for example, in a ballet dancer, many of them have really tight external hip rotators. They have maxed out their hip external rotation, and then they really lack um, hip internal rotation and may not be as flexible in that direction and may be weak if they try to do movements with the hip in that position just from uh, lack of variation of training. So that brings us to muscle training. The last slide here, this shows um, some of the types of exercises that I will be doing often with dancers, so some dance-specific rehab exercises um, for painful hip. And we can kind of go through this. If anybody has questions at the end, I can talk about it a little bit more in detail. But I just want to give kind of like a general framework that I like to work with. Um, if I'm looking at a dancer and I'm thinking that they may have some instability, some functional instability or structural where their hip joint isn't moving correctly um, or is moving too much, then I like to set them up with a solid foundation by first looking at the local stabilizers and then the global stabilizers and then the global movers, mobilizers. So what I mean by that, local stabilizers, these are muscles that are really small, they're deep muscles, they're postural muscles, and they usually cross just one joint. Their function is to provide support and stability, and they are often anticipatory muscles, so they should um, tighten up before they're needed. Um, so there's sort of this coordination that's important to them. And um, the local stabilizers play a really important role also in proprioception, which is really um, fundamental to balance. So everybody knows that dancers um, really need to be, I was going to say on point with their, with their balance, no pun intended. But um, what do we do for this? So I typically work on some really foundational some stabilizing work for the deep core musculature. So the transverse abdominis is one of the corset muscles that wraps around the spine. It goes from the spine into the linea alba at the front of the abdominal wall. And it sort of just acts to stabilize everything and keep sort of a container of intra-abdominal pressure between the top half of the body and the bottom half of the body. 
the multifidi are in the back, and then the really deep pelvic floor muscles that work on uh, deep hip, hip external rotation. Those muscles help keep the femur right centered in the acetabulum. So like we talked about, the, the hip joint is happy when the femur is centered. And so these local stabilizer, stabilizers are really important. If the local stabilizers aren't strong, people tend to rely more on larger muscle groups. So we want to start here. And then once a dancer is really competent and good at activating these muscles in a coordinated way, I'll move on to working with them with global stabilizers. And these are um, stabilizing muscles that work more to produce movement. So they are stabilizing at n ranges of motion and help with rotational control. So when I'm working with these, I tend to take the dancer less in lying on the floor doing mat work, more standing exercises and trying to work with them in dance specific motions um, so that there is specificity to their training. And say a dancer is having knee pain in second position. Instead of taking them into that extended leg um, batma or developé position, where they're kicking, I might have them do a passe, which is this picture on the bottom right, where their knee is bent. So that just decreases sort of the strength needed to maintain stability at the hip joint. So we'll, we'll decrease the lever arm is what we would call it in physics terms. So um, yeah, that's sort of where we're transitioning more to standing postures and exercising exercises moving the whole limb rather than just bracing and stabilizing. Um, these muscles of the global stabilizers would be the deep hip rotators again, the glutes, larger muscles of the core like the internal external obliques or the rectus abdominis. Um, the lats as well would help stabilize the core. And then the global movers. These are the, the muscles that tend to get the most attention in training, but I would um, say really should come last when we're trying to rehab uh, an injured dancer. And so these muscles oftentimes span two or three joints. They are the movers, so they move the skeletal system. We need adequate muscle length, and so um, that makes us think more about stretching. And they're important for those larger movements, a grand batma, which is the high kick, or a big jeté across the floor, a leaping motion. Dancers that may be surprising to some, oftentimes dancers are somewhat um, weak in their calf muscles, we would think the opposite, but you know, we're finding that dancers may have on testing some lack of endurance and that can lead to problems up the kinetic chain. So I always check, even if a dancer looks really good in their releve or kind of lifted heel raised position, I would wanna check and see how their endurance with that is or how their endurance with jumping is. Um, and then, also, they tend to have very tight calf muscles. Same thing with the hips. Dancers tend to be kind of tight around the hips um, and then have a little bit of excessive mobility in hamstrings and um, maybe even hip flexors. So just to kind of recap on this, we wanna work starting out with exercises that are going to lead to a solid foundation to build upon as we return the dancer to their full participation um, and rehearsals and classes. So I tried to breeze through that to leave room for questions, but if anybody has questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, I know that I focused a lot on ballet, but I would say that Many, many dancers, even if they are um, specializing in modern dance or jazz dance, are taking technique classes in ballet as well. And so it's a good place to start if you are a physical therapist who is looking to treat dancers, um, just getting a little bit more education in the realm of ballet technique. All right, open for questions. Elise, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, really great information on a, on a topic that uh, I know I don't see a, a ton of. So 
um, they come in the door and I usually send them right over to you because uh, you've got you've got the expertise on it. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions for Elise today? Well, while you're considering that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put in the uh, in the chat one more time our um, our Facebook page and our YouTube link uh, in case anybody wants to head on over to see what else is going on. Um, and also, while you're thinking here, I uh, can let you know that next month's topic uh, is going to be uh, knee injuries for runners. Um, and I'll be doing that one, and I believe that's going to be on the 12th of May, so the second second Thursday of May. Didn't want to preempt Cinco de Mayo, so uh, we'll wait on that. Um, all right, going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Elise, for presenting. Thank you for being here. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again at the next Therapy Thursday. And if you missed any portion of this, please head over to our YouTube page. It'll be posted up there later today. All right. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank all you. Right, thank you.